So today I want to share some thoughts with you on who are you. Now each of you by name that are here today, but there, there seems to be a theme that seems to be pulsating through my mind quite a lot these days. And how a lot of people don't really know who they are. That is, how God views them. I'll we'll start with a story that Ken Crockett, or Kent Crockett, shared. He said, Christian psychologist James Michelson once counseled a lady who felt lonely and abandoned. As she explained how she felt, she, he couldn't concentrate on what she was saying because a scripture kept running through his mind. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves, was that scripture, which is Psalm 100, verse 3. This verse had no apparent connection with her problem, but he couldn't quit thinking about that scripture. As she finished talking, she sat in silence waiting for a response. So the doctor didn't know what to say other than quote this scripture verse. Although he realized it might sound foolish since, he, since it seemed unrelated to her situation. I think God wants you to know something, this doctor said. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. Does that mean anything at all to you? After composing herself, she explained what it meant to her. I didn't tell you this, but my mother got pregnant with me before she was married, and all my life I believed that I was a mistake, an unplanned accident, and God didn't create me. When you quoted that verse, I pictured in my mind God forming me in my mother's womb. Now I know that God created me and that I'm not a mistake. I'll never be the same again. Thank you, doctor. I'll never forget this day as long as I live. God knew this woman needed to know that she was a marvelous creation and not some accident. A guy named Marty Rubin said, Behind every mask there is a face, and behind that face is always a story. Everybody has a story. Everybody has situations and struggles that they've been going through for a long time. What labels have you been allowed to? to be placed on your life, or on your mind, or in your attitude, or in your path. Some equate the car that they drive, or where they live, as, as really a definition of them. I was driving to church today in a beautiful black, clean black, by the way. Jaguar comes to the left of me. And uh, I think earlier in the, in the drive, a BMW comes flying, a blue, dark blue BMW. Then I look at our van, and I'm thinking, oh my. It would be so nice to have a, a Jaguar or a BMW. But thank God that we have a, a van that gets from A to B. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, I started, so I had to shake myself a little bit and remind myself what I was going to be talking about today. That you know, maybe I should be thankful for what I have. You know, hear what I'm saying. Before we had children, I thought that my identity was based on whether or not we had children or not. And I went through it, as, as you all know, for, for a long time. One day, several years ago, I got a call from The Gap. Now, we're talking probably 20 years ago now, so it's been a, a few years. The Gap called me in from Westview Mall when there was a Westview Mall there. It doesn't exist anymore, as far as I know. So we got a call from The Gap, and I don't, I never shopped. I don't think I've ever stepped foot. Maybe I stepped foot one time in The Gap store, but never made a habit of it for whatever reason. So. I got a call from them, and they said, well, somebody just uh, charged X amount of dollars on your card. I just wanted to make sure that that was, was you, in essence, what they said. I said, no, I haven't been in the gap in however many years. Long story short, somebody stole my what? My identity. How many times have people in the world don't know who they are, and they're, they're li living a life right now defined by society? How many kids have you known who have insisted upon wearing the best of the best because the kids in the school were the best of the best. Right. That kind of pressure, that kind of culture doesn't change whether or not you're a kid in school or whether you're, you're an adult. A guy named John Wooden said, be more concerned with your character, great coach John Wooden by the way, be more concerned with your character than your reputation because your character is what you really are. Listen, your character is what you really are while your reputation is merely what others think you are over in the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter reminds me, and I hope reminds all of us who we are. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, but you are a chosen people. That's a good thing. 
a royal priesthood, I like that, a holy nation, right? A people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful life. You can't get more descriptive than that. We're not junk. We're not somebody's trash. In Romans chapter 8, starting in verse number 35, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Remember that text? Uh, shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. And it's written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But listen to this. It says, no, in all these things we are what? More than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor neither the present or the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation, listen, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That, that's some serious caveats that says nothing's going to get in the way from separating our love from God. It seems that one of the, the tricks that the, that the evil one sets our way is to get people to think, little of themselves and frankly want to try to fit into somebody else's skin. That Again, that, that peer pressure of wanting to be like somebody else or some other group. I, I call it societal peer pressure. Societal peer pressure. And, and it's everywhere. I don't care what country you're in. I don't care what zip code you're in. It's there. And for you and I to stand up and realize who we are, that we don't have to follow what society says that we need to be. We need to be more concerned about what God says that we need Neil Anderson said in his book, Victory Over the Darkness, he said, people cannot consistently behave in ways that are inconsistent with the way they perceive themselves. Let me repeat it. People cannot consistently behave in ways that are inconsistent with the way they perceive themselves. Mm -hmm. Paul said uh, roughly 130 times that we're supposed to be in Christ, that we're supposed to be act like Christ, we're supposed to walk like Christ. We're supposed to be Christ-like in everything that we do. And I don't know about you, but some days it's a whole lot easier to act Christ-like than it is versus other days, especially when uh, the old term is the, the old flesh rises up, the desire to take life into your own hands and try to do stuff in your own way instead of the way God would rather us have it. Our identity is supposed to be really founded in what Christ has done for us. Steve Malone writes, so much of what Christ he teaches is really just his words, nuts according to what society says. He says, the way up in God is down. Totally opposite of what the world teaches, right? The way in is out, according to scripture. The way first is last. The way of success is service. The way of attainment is relinquishment, he says. The way of strength is what? Weakness, right? The way of security is vulnerability, he says. The way of protection is, yikes, forgiveness, even 70 times 7, the scripture says, right? Know your strength, because why? That's the, that's the only way that you can lay them down. That's the only way that you and I can surrender who we are and what we are to God. Romans 12 says, just after... The writer says that we're supposed to be transformed by the renovation of our mind. It says, verse 3, For by grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with, what's it say in some text, sober judgment. Sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith that God has given you. So it's, I think, Satan's job to do everything possible for you and I not to understand our identity in Christ. The older I get, I'm looking back and talking to and communicating with many of my high school mates and how so oftentimes we were, all of us, were sucked into the culture of the time rather than really being ourselves. And an accurate, I think, self uh, view is critical for us to understand where we can go in God. I can remember as a, as a older teen, and I didn't have that many responsibilities. I had, a, I, had I was working from 16 on. But there, there were times when I would just get in, in, in my car and go out and purposely get lost. You say, why would I purposely get lost? 
because I like the challenge of finding my way out of something and learn new roads and new, new paths. But that can be smart in some ways and not so smart in other ways. As you know, I, I like watching these wilderness shows. And there was this, I can't remember the, the, the name of the show, but there were, there was these three teams of guys that were in Alaska, and they were each given a map. So each team had a map to get to a certain point, and if they got to a certain point by a certain time, they were to be taken out on a plane and rescued and fed and all that stuff. Well, one of these teams decided to tear up their map because they wanted to do it the old-fashioned way. And I think sometimes that people in your life and my life don't understand that there's a map that's been given us. It's called the Holy Bible. That gives us direction in everything that we do, but many people don't value the power behind that map. And in this case, this particular show, he literally tore up the map and burned it. Now, he came in last, if memory serves, to that, to that place because he threw away his direction. How many times have it you and I, though we've been maybe in the faith for a long time, that we have, in our own little way, devalued the importance of God's word day to day? Maybe instead of being a priority to go to to get direction in our lives, maybe it's not so important, even though, again, many of us have been in church and walked with, with Christ and then really uh, had that relationship with God for a long time. It has become not as important as it used to be. So I'm kind of encouraging today to, to get back to that foundation that can give you the power and the strength. Second Corinthians says that, that, he had, that as God has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts. When our kids were in martial arts, they were identified by the color of their belt. It didn't matter what zip code they came from. It didn't matter, uh, you know, what uh, what state they lived in. It didn't matter the kind of car they were in when they got there. It didn't matter what kind of house state they resided in. No, it, what mattered was the belt. And I dare say that we are identified, all of us, with one color. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. That if we go to God and say, I, I've Sorry for my sins. I messed up. God washes those sins away with His with His precious blood. I was told a story of a story that actually is called the Happy Hypocrite. It's a story about a man who was born with an awful facial deformity. He grew up alone and lonely. When reaching adulthood, he decided to move from his town to begin a new life. And on his way, he discovered a beautiful mask that fit his making that made him look handsome. At first, the mask was uncomfortable, and he was afraid that people would find out who he really was, but he continued to wear the mask every single day. In his new hometown, he made many friends, and he eventually fell in love. But one day, a wicked woman from his old hometown came to his town and discovered the man's true identity. In front of his friends and fiance, he, she forced him to remove his mask. When he removed the mask, he revealed, it revealed a handsome face. His face, listen, had conformed to the mask. So the analogy here is the more we tend to soak up what's in the Bible, Amen. in the scriptures, that gives us really direction in life and a path and encouragement and instruction, then the more that we become what's written in the book, because that's our manual to get there. All right. Ephesians chapter 2 reminds me of something because there's times when I, I find myself striving to be what I need to be, which is something that's important. But there's another piece to, to that striving. In Ephesians 2, starting in verse 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, by grace. And that, not of yourselves, here's the part I highlighted. It is the gift of God, and not as a result of works, so that no one might boast. For, listen, you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The message paraphrase says it this way. Saving is all his idea and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. Don't play the major role. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. 
Now, God neither, neither make nor save, or so we can't save ourselves. God does both making and saving. He, he creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join with him in the work he does, the good work he has gotten ready for us to do, work we had better be doing. Joyce Meyer said this. She, she, she said, a, a dictionary defines masterpiece as a person's greatest work of art or a consummate example of skill or excellence. She, she says, now when God's word describes you as his masterpiece, right, what comes to your mind? Do you accept his assessment? Do you think that you're God's masterpiece? Uh, someday, <laughs> I'm not so sure if I think I'm God's masterpiece. Especially when I look in the mirror, it's like, oh, no, not me, right? Well, he, she says, well, he must be talking about someone else, or if he really knew me, he wouldn't think that. She says, I had made the frustrating, tragic mistake of trying to find the kingdom of God, which is righteousness, peace, and joy in things in other people, instead of what God gave me. She says, my joy, my identity can be found in Christ alone. You know, if the world knew that, that their true joy, that their true satisfaction, that their, their true contentment, which I think many people are looking for contentment in this world, that they can only really find that contentment through Christ. Scripture says in 2 Corinthians 5 that, that if anybody's in Christ, if anybody asks Jesus to forgive them of, of their sins and begins to walk the walk that Jesus teaches in Scripture, that old things then have what? Passed away. So then behold, all things then start over again. They start new. So all that stuff, all that baggage that you and I have from the past doesn't have to be there anymore because when we become part of Christ's family, then that's literally washed away. Right. One, one uh, Joyce Meyer said that one day she's rereading the Amplified Bible in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. She says, it said, For we walk by faith, or we regulate our lives uh, and conduct ourselves by our conviction or belief respecting man's relationship to God and divine things. We trust in holy fervor, thus we walk not by sight or appearance. I don't know about you, but it is really tough for me not to walk by what I see. I think I shared that a week or two ago about how our five senses distract us from stuff that we should know. The Holy Spirit said, according to Joyce Meyer, stopped her and said, Joyce, what do you believe about your relationship with God? Do you believe that he loves you? Do you and I, do you and I believe that God loves us unconditionally? Absolutely. That all the stuff you've done before, all the stuff you've messed up with, it, it doesn't matter to God anymore. If you surrender, if I surrender my life to God, all that stuff doesn't matter. It's washed away. Right. Oscar Wilde said one time, most people are other people. Their thoughts are someone else's opinions. Their, their lives a mimicry. Their passions a quotation. I go back to what I said earlier. How many young people are just copying what is out there today? Because other people do it doesn't make it sensible always for you to do it at the same time. That's right. That's a, without knowing what you're really here to do in the world creates a miserable life. Have you ever met people that are just plain miserable? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're nasty, they're, they're complaining, they're ugly, not physically, but internally, they're ugly. I mean, you can have the prettiest person on the planet, but they can have an ugly, ugly personality. Mm -hmm. You know why? Many times because they haven't realized why they're here in the first place. Romans 8 says, but God commended, listen, but God commended his love for us while we were yet sinners. <coughs> Christ died for us. So while we were still in our muck, in our trash, God paid the price to free us through Jesus Christ. This is old news I know to most of us. But there are millions of people in the world who still don't know this. I know there's many doctrines and many beliefs out there that says you have to earn your right to God. That you have to do, do, do. God says, no, I'm done. All you have to do is believe that I've, I've, I've done. Amen. Have you noticed that that many people in the Bible had, had, had a, a massive life mission that God called them to do. Sometimes it was some, some big stuff. We had Noah. I mean, Noah had, had a big deal to do, right? We know that story. And Abraham was certainly one of the, the big guys in, in Scripture. And there was Joseph and Moses and Joshua and, and Nehemiah and Peter and Paul. But there's also some, and I'll use the term in quotes, lesser known people that their role was as important as those major players. Let me give a quick couple examples. Jethro. 
was just a, just briefly mentioned here and there, right? But important. How about Aaron? Big time important, right? Although he wasn't the main focus of everything. Caleb, for sure, in the Old Testament. How about Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist? I mean, sm small roles from a Moses point of view, but a large role in God's eyes. Amen. So when you think that your role in life that God can leverage through you for the sake of other people, it's not so small. Because you don't know what's going to happen as a result of your obedience. There's little things, like I mentioned moments ago before I started the uh, recording here, how, how God sometimes impresses us to do things that frankly don't make sense at the time. Mm -hmm. But you don't know how your obedience is going to impact the other party that you're trying to get across or God's impressing upon you to do something for. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to kind of skip around between a few texts, but in Ephesians chapter 4, I want to go to verse 1, 3, 4, 12, 13, and 16. So I don't expect you to follow me. But Ephesians 4, it says, Therefore I am a prisoner serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. Think about that. Living a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Again, skipping around. Making every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope in the future. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Let me repeat that last part here. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we, until we all come to such unity of our faith and knowledge of God's Son. And it goes on to say that each, as each part does its own special work, listen, it helps the other parts grow. So that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So if you think that your part isn't important or it doesn't matter, it does in a big way. I, I'm, not, I'm not much of a baker, but I know that if you don't put certain things in a certain product, that it's not going to turn out very good. Mm -hmm. I'm sure some of you have forgotten some things in your baking days that it turned out not so good, whatever it might be. Can I get an amen? amen. Can I get, I mean, it happens to the best of us. Romans chapter 2, again, I'm repeating, but it's important. Romans chapter, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 12 says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead, plead with you to give your bodies to God. To give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior, listen, don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, it says, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Mm -hmm. By changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So unless we surrender, unless you surrender, unless I surrender my life to God, then we're not going to know how to transform our minds so that we can understand what God's trying to get across to us to impact people that, frankly, we may not even know yet. Amen. Tina Sue writes that there's some ways that maybe you can figure out where or how God's wired you. Let me give you several examples that she has given. Her name is Tina Sue, S-U. She says, what makes you smile? That's just one example of maybe something that God has placed in you that's so deep that maybe that could be a, a, a twinge or a flavor or, or a piece of where he's trying to lead you. Number two, what are your favorite things to do in the past? What about now? Things that, that, that light your fire. Number three, what activities make you lose track of time besides Facebook, besides watching TV? Number four, what makes you feel great about yourself? Number five, who inspires you most? Which, quali which qualities inspire you in each person? <clears throat> Maybe somebody's life that you know or have read about or have studied about has inspired you. Well, how come? Why? What, what piece of that? Number six, what are you naturally good at? Your skills and abilities and gifts. We've talked about this in this church. We're wired in four different ways. Why not maximize those? those that, why not maximize that wiring? Number seven, what do people typically ask for you to help in? 
Maybe there, there's a natural gift or talent that you have that maybe you don't view it as a natural talent or gift. Maybe your compassion. Maybe your love for people. Maybe your, your, your attention to detail. Maybe your, your flamboyance with people. Maybe your leadership qualities. All that stuff God can leverage and, 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 and rewire to please God that can really touch so many people's lives. Number eight, if you had, if you had to teach something, what would you teach? What's that burning thing in there? Like, like I've told many groups before, like Popeye, you know, I can't stand it anymore. There, there's something in you that, that maybe, maybe is so deep and burning that it, you got to do something about it. No, number nine. What would you regret not fully doing or not being or having in your life? What would you regret? And we'll get to that just now. And, and, and this last one, she says, you're now 90 years old, sitting on a rocking chair outside your porch, and you feel the spring breeze gently brushing against your face. You're blissful and happy and are pleasing with the wonderful life you've been blessed with. Looking back at your life and all that you've achieved and acquired, all the relationships you've developed, what matters most to you then? So in essence, I've, I've heard people teach this before. Fast forward in your life 30, 40, 50 years, and then look back what you want to happen or what you think God can do with you, and then plan your life from backwards and see what God can do, and then start taking those steps forward. Does it make, 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 make any sense to anybody? This is, this is something that has to be done, because if not, guess what? You and I are going to be 90 like that. Romans 12 says... In the New Living Translation, Romans 12, starting in verse 1, I think I've said this before, but in another paraphrase. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that God will find as acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and, and customs of this world, but let, listen, but let God transform you into a new person by changing again. I know I'm repeating, but it's an important point. Changing the way you think. Then you'll learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect, because of the privilege and authority God has given me. I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Have you ever met people that think they're all that? And you find out that they're some of the most ugliest people on the planet? I mean, they're downright ugly because they think they're all that. I mean, sorry, I digress. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given you. Measuring the faith, measuring yourselves by the faith as God. Because you've been given a certain measure of faith, and I've been given a measure of faith, and guess what? I can't manage on your, on your measure of faith, and guess what? You can't manage on my measure of faith. Some people have asked me online, how do you go through the stuff you're going through? Is there a choice? Is there another option? You take a day at a time and you rely on the mercy and the grace of God for that day. I, I don't like that, by the way. You know me long enough to know that I like to plan stuff out at least a few hours. <laughs> Ideally a few years, right? God doesn't work that way. He says, I want to give you enough information for today. In fact, for the next step most days. I, I don't like it. That's not the way I run my life. Well... God says, if, I'm, if you're now wearing the, the toga of manhood, that is that you're now the part of my family, this is how I run. This is how I do my business. So if you're going to be a part of my business, then you trust me for today. It doesn't mean that you don't plan for tomorrow. I'm not suggesting that at all. But it, when it goes down to trusting God for what God can do with you today, then sometimes God doesn't warn, listen, sometimes God doesn't warn you of stuff that he wants you to do next week because he knows you, you know what, what's going to happen. You're going to run the other way. You're going to run because it's scary. It's terrifying. But God says, you know what? I'm going to give you what you need to know today. Trust me today. Reach under the glass. Grab the person's hand. Make a difference in somebody's life today. Because you don't know what that simple act of obedience is going to mean in their life in one year, five years, ten years down the road. Make sense? Amen. Sometimes God is waiting for you and I to go get our inheritance. If somebody came up to me and said that, oh, let me give you an example. Somebody in the last um, couple of weeks sent me a check. It was not a, a huge check, but I could have framed that check. I could have looked at that check. I could have loved on that check. I could have held that check. I could have, you know, painted that check. I could have put little smiley faces on that check. 
unless unless I would have taken the check to the bank, that check would have been just what? A piece of paper. Well, unless you and I use the information, let me say it a different way. Unless you and I leverage the information in the Holy Scriptures that's given to us a couple thousand, a few thousand years ago, then it's just a piece of paper. It's just a bunch of words. Now, I'm sure you've read Scripture in the past that whatever it is, wherever it is, it just jumps out to you and grabs your heart because you are going through a certain situation at a certain time. Those words in that book gives life. It can transform whatever you're going through. Amen. An inheritance is something that, that, that a, a, a person comes into p p p possession of because of a relationship. It's a relationship that somebody is given something or willed something or left something because of the relationship. I dare say that we have been left with a treasure. King James calls it a treasure in, in earthen vessels, a treasure inside us that all we have to do is open up. Thomas Brooks writes, Satan promises the best, but pays with the worst. He promises honor and patience uh, and pays with disgrace. He promises pleasure and pays with pain. He promises profit and pays with loss. He promises life and what? <clears throat> pays with death. Longer story short, Satan's just a liar. Sorry. Satan, I can, that's one of my pet peeves. I cannot stand a liar. Casting all my cares on him. In fact, I have that in I have that scripture in my kitchen. I think I need to read it more often. Do you hear what I'm saying? In Joshua chapter 11, Joshua was being prepared for a battle, and I'm going to skip through the very meat of it, down to verse 6 in Joshua 11. And God said to Joshua, "Don't be afraid because of them, for tomorrow I will deliver at this time tomorrow them into your hand." Well, I, again, I'm not a, a scholar by any stretch. But if God told Joshua not to be afraid, then guess what Joshua may have been? Afraid. Joshua may have been afraid, right? So if Joshua, the great Joshua, was afraid because of what was facing him, guess what? Isn't it probably pretty normal for us to be afraid too? But so many times throughout Scripture, God says to what? To fear not because God's with us throughout the stuff that we, we have to go through. There seems to be something that God makes us fight for what God gives us. I'll say it again. Sometimes there's something to be said about God wanting us to fight for what God gives us. I, I don't know about you, but there's something to be said. There's some value in fighting for something that you really want. Mm -hmm. Because then I think, I think it's human nature for us to, to appreciate it. <coughs> um, Again, my temptation is to share a personal example. But when you work for something and you pay for something with your own money, it's a lot more valuable than somebody giving it to you. And then you may not care for it as much if it wasn't your money. So young people, old people think about that, right? I'm going to end, end with, with, with this. There's a lot more to share, but I'll end with this. Uh, Dr. Anthony Campolo tells of a study of which 50 people over the age of uh, 95 were asked one question. If you could live your life over again, what would you do differently? I'm sure you've heard this before. The open-ended question was met with a multiplicity of answers from the respondents. However, three answers emerged to dominate the result of the study. Three. They said, if I had to do it over again, I would reflect more. Number two, if I had to do it over again, I would risk more. And number three, if I had to do it over again, I would do more things that would live on after I'm dead. I would do things more uh, that would live on after I'm dead. So I encourage you, I, th I think in me too, to realize what your capacity is when you and I decide to surrender your life and my life to God. Because when you and I fully surrender, which again is opposite to what life teaches us. Life teaches that you fight for what's yours. You do, you bust your behind to do what you need to do, which is all very true. But ultimately, that our surrender to what God wants in our lives gives us the most satisfaction. That gives us the most contentment. That gives us the spring in our step to get up every morning 
instead of saying, you know, oh God, it's morning, you know, I, you know, but thank God it's the morning. I'm able to make a difference in somebody's life.